Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Khuda. I'm your host, Fuad Muhammad. And we have the privilege as well today to welcome on the show Dr. Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Fuad. You're welcome, Sheikh. Um, just before we go into our first question, we'd like to remind the viewers that today is only dedicated for the emails, and we would like to thank all the viewers who have been sending to us uh, all their emails, and we try to answer it, and we try to dedicate a program especially for their emails. And for those who would like to send us email, you can send it at ask at huda dot tv. Um, Doctor, we start with Sister Mariam's question from Nigeria. She has three questions, but her first question is about zakah on gold jewelry. She wants to know if she has to pay the, the zakah based on the price she bought the gold for on the, or the current market prices. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wal-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Wala udwana illa ala al-zalimeen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyid al-awaleen wal-akhirina Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. I praise Allah the Almighty alone and I send the best peace and blessings upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Whenever it is time to pay the due zakah upon positions, whether trade or investment or saving, money, cash or goods, or gold and silver, mm -hmm. it will be according to the day's value, the day on which I'm going to pay the zakah. So if I bought uh, some goods wholesale mm -hmm. and I'm uh, selling them retail, and uh, now it is time to pay my zakah, and the price has been doubled. I pay the zakah upon the current value retail. I have gold which I bought when the gram was 50 bucks. Now it's 150 bucks, for instance. Mm -hmm. I pay on the current value, according to the market value, on the same debt that uh, you're paying the zakah. Not according to uh, the initial purchase. Okay, and she also asked, is, can I share the zakah? amongst many people or, did, or can I give it also to one person? That's totally your choice based on your judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah At-Tawbah in verse number 60, This verse stated that there are eight categories those who are eligible for the zakah sum, the mandatory zakah, according to the Qur'an. The poor, the desperate, uh, those who do not have the basic needs, mm -hmm. and uh, the employees who are being hired by the state in order to collect the zakah and redistribute it. And al-mu'allafati qulubuhum, those who are near to Islam or about to enter Islam and they needed help. Wa fil riqab and in freeing the slave neck, people who uh, uh, are being uh, enslaved whenever there was slavery, Islam encouraged freeing the slaves. Yes. So if you know somebody that who uh, have agreed with his owner or master that if I pay a uh, certain amount of money that I'll be free, Islam encourages us to help them from the zakah fund. And al mean those who are drowned in debt. And mm -hmm. they're not expected to settle their debt or pay it off because it is too big for them. وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ This is a very broad category. Uh, da'wah, uh, fighting on, in, in the cause of Allah on a battlefield, the Muslims army, the military, the navy, the marines, all of that. وَبِنِ السَّبِيلِ and a wafer. Many, many times we meet some people say that I was traveling and I lost my money, I don't have any means, I just need uh, you know, somebody to send me home or whatever. Uh, a wayfarer, a traveler who does not have the means is also eligible to be assisted from the zakah fund. These are the categories whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approved. And mm -hmm. it is not permissible to give in any other field other yes. than those eight categories. So uh, there is a difference of opinions whether that it is permissible to give it to one category or you have to distribute it upon the eight categories. And Allah knows best that it is okay if you find one category who is more eligible than the other. Like if you have a brother or sister a friend or a neighbor that if he doesn't settle his debt, he will be imprisoned. Mm -hmm. He will be sent to jail, will be arrested. And be, he doesn't have the means. They're going to kick him out of his house and his kids will be homeless. And the debt would encompass your entire zakah. Maybe it would need also some fund from others. In this condition, I may pay my entire zakah dues 
to one person. Mm -hmm. So it depends on your best judgment based on the needs of uh, those who are already eligible for it. Okay, and our third question, she said, she's talking about a custom that happens when someone dies. It's, she says, on the third, the seventh, or the fortieth day, when a person dies, it is accepted. She wants to know if it's accepted in Islam to slaughter a sheep or to buy sweets and biscuits or cook or make things All and share it. All these traditions are mm. invalid, are false traditions, have been inherited from non-Muslim societies, from the time of ignorance, from uh, Hinduism and paganism and all of that. Islam does not recognize any of that. Islam does not allow mourn the death of any person more than three days, other than the husband, four months and ten days, for the wife. Mm -hmm to mourn her husband for four months and ten days. Besides that, and how to mourn, uh, uh, it is not by celebrating on the 40th, then after four months, by gathering the people and reciting Quran, or making a celebration or commemoration, all of that is invalid. Oh. Condolence is only within the first three days after the death of the person. After that, it is over. If you are able to attend the funeral, you give the condolence, and that's it. There is no gatherings in order to uh, receive people to give the condolence. Those who would come by chance to give the condolence, and that's it. What people do, unfortunately, in most Muslim societies, mm -hmm. they celebrate or they commemorate the death of the person on the third, then on the four years, then in four months later, then annually, all of that is totally invalid, even if the gathering is just gathered to recite Qur'an and distribute any charity and feed the poor, that's totally invalid. So how do we go about it if we want to give any charity in order to assist and benefit the dead person? We understand that giving any charity on behalf of a dead person would definitely help him. If the donor, whether he gives from, his, uh, from the, the deceased positions or from his position, it would reach him. Mm. If a person... Uh, performs the Umrah on behalf of somebody and he spends out of that Umrah or Hajj from his own money or from the inheritance which the dead person left behind, it will be also accepted and it will benefit the dead person with the intention of the doer. But uh, having a special commemoration for that mm -hmm. is not permissible. So I can go to any orphanage and I donate some money to mm -hmm. feed the poor or buy a new set of clothes or shoes or school supplies for the beginning of the year. And my intention is, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend this reward, or transfer the reward to the asset of the good deeds of the dead person. That is accepted. So it's a continuous charity, whether for my money or his money. Any other form, such as having a special gathering mm. to do these practices, yes. is invalid. Okay, okay. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. And Sister Sabira from the UAE, she says... Um, we know that men can, cannot wear gold in Islam, but how about white gold and platinum? Is this allowed? In the sound hadith, the Prophet ﷺ held in one hand gold and in the other hand silk. Mm -hmm. And he stated that these two items, as zahab wal harir, gold and silk, are forbidden for the men from my ummah, while they are permissible mm -hmm. for their women. It is permissible for a woman to wear gold jewelry as adornment, as mean of beautifications, gold, silver, silk is okay, but it is not permissible for a man. Nowadays there is a new fashion where they say that it's gold, but it is white gold. Mm -hmm. When you ask the professionals, it's gold. Mm -hmm. Maybe 21 carat or whatever, and it is uh, plated with the silver. So it looks like uh, white gold, or they call it, as long as it is gold, cheaper or more expensive than the gold, as long as it is gold or have a percentage of gold, then it is prohibited for men. Okay. Our next email is from a young uh, brother. His name is Muhammad. And he says, my question to you is, how old do I have to be before I, my sins are counted? Asking this question really indicates that you have uh, either approached the age or you're already in it. Mm -hmm. The Prophet wasallam so said in the hadith, رفي al qalamu." The pen with which the angels record our deeds, good and bad, have been lifted. And it does not record the bad actions of three categories. الصبي حتى يبلو The youngster until he or she reaches the puberty age. النائم حتى يستيقظ A person who's asleep until he wakes up. 
Imagine if a person while asleep turned over if he is obese and he killed a child. Mm -hmm. He did not mean it. Mm -hmm. But there is, of course, there is a penalty for that. But he will not be punished as a deliberate killing. Yes. Or somebody overslept and he did not wake up for the prayer. Mm -hmm. So he missed praying on time until the time of the next prayer has entered. Uh, he has to make up the prayer, but he is not blameworthy because he did not mean it. He was asleep. Yes. And so forth. Uh, the third is al majnunu hatta yafiq, the person who is experiencing insanity or he lost his mind until he comes back to his senses. So as sabi until he reaches the puberty age or the age where he recognizes what's right from what's wrong. Before that, his good deeds would do count, but mm -hmm. his bad deeds would not be counted against him. Okay. And uh, we have another question here from Brother Hanif, and he says that um, people make mass on ordinary socks, the socks, socks that they wear, um, if this is permissible. Uh, let me just repeat the question because the word mess mm -hmm. may be interpreted as mess being possessed by the jinn. Okay. Rather, it is mess. Okay. Mess means wiping. So he's asking or inquiring, as I understood, about wiping over ordinary socks. Mm -hmm. It is permissible. And Nabi allowed us to wipe over leather shoes or shoes or socks with a thin or thick, as long as they, you call them socks, mm -hmm. and they cover the color of the epiderm or the foot. Because there are, uh, you know, socks which are like pantyhose. Yes. You know, they're not really socks, rather it is just to give a, a fainting color, mm -hmm. a gray color, a black color. Uh, to the ladies, for instance, mm -hmm. but they are not functioning as socks. So, if we're talking about socks, whether thin or thick, it is permissible for a person who is resident, not traveling, to wipe over the socks uh, <clears throat> instead of making wudu, providing the person have performed wudu before putting them on, mm -hmm. whether he or she. Second. It will be valid to keep on for 24 hours. So the five daily prayers, I expressed about them in another term, which is 24 hours. I mean, I can actually offer more than five prayers mm -hmm. with the, if I'm a resident, how? If, if I make wudu, then I put my socks on and I pray two, three prayers. But this wudu with the initial wudu. Yes. Then I void my wudu and I was ready to make another wudu. And instead of taking off the socks, I wiped over the socks. So I start counting from now, from the moment where I wiped over the socks 24 hours. Subhanallah. Okay? Yes. Yawm wa layla. After that expires, now I want to make a new wudu. We say, now we have to take them off and wash the feet. The 24 hours will be extended to 72 hours or 3 days and nights if the person is traveling. Because if you're traveling, you are more in need for this facility and this license, in addition to the permissibility and the recommendation of combining the prayers whenever it's necessary and shortening the prayer, the four rakahs, into two. Okay, and we have an interesting question here. I think it's from Nigeria. The brother is asking, can a person vote for a non-Muslim who is contesting against a Muslim? I think it's for some leadership role. And he says, unfortunately, the the non-Muslim would give us more benefits. Uh, let me say that this is some sort of a tricky question because mm -hmm. I have to know the situation before saying yes or no. When we have the choice between a Muslim and a non-Muslim, in leadership definitely will give the precedence to uh, a Muslim. This is not uh, a question. There is no question about it. But now we're talking about if somebody is living in a non-Muslim state or in a Muslim state which is totally secular, we have people who are only Muslims by name. Oh. And whenever those people reach this position, they destroy more than any benefit they, they introduce. They um, impose new laws and they request banning the Azan, limiting uh, uh, the construction of the Masajid, uh, they call for taking the veil off, banning Muslim girls from entering the schools if they want to go to the 
we, we have many people like them, whether in the West or in Muslim countries. So sometimes such person, we have to keep him away from office. If it is up to us in a peaceful and legitimate way through the voting boxes. If this is the case, I should never vote for such person. Mm -hmm. I would only vote for a person who uh, vows to offer services that would really make Muslims prosper, would make Muslims be able to practice their religious practices freely with ease and in, 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 in a peaceful environment. But such person who is willing to give up on the deen in order to draw nearer to the rulers and uh, be adopted by uh, Zionist lobbies and all of that, such person should be kept away from office if we have the chance to do so. Okay, and the second question is that if a Christian woman uh, accepts Islam, does she have to, is her marriage to her Christian husband null and void? If the person, if the husband maintains his religion and does not accept Islam, then they should be separated. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُوا you should not give your doors to the non-believers until they become believers. And also, in a whole surah which is known as Al-Mumtahana, uh, the tested woman, that if a woman come to us and she accepted Islam, we're not allowed to return her back to her husband who is not Muslim. There is no superiority. Uh, or authority of a non-Muslim over a Muslim. If we have this, uh, if we have this possibility to fulfill yes. this verse, so in this condition, it is totally uh, prohibited for a Muslim woman to marry to a non-Muslim. But the question remains: What if the person accepted Islam, or if both of them accepted Islam at the same time? Then do we have to process a new marriage contract because mm. the earlier marriage contract, the original one, was done outside the folds of Islam? or according to their faith, which Islam does not recognize? No, we don't have to. So whether she accepted Islam first or he accepted Islam first, as long as they both accepted Islam and within the Idda period, the three months or the three periods, then they should maintain their marriage without having to process a new marriage contract. Okay, now we have a question here from Brother Abdul Rauf from Pakistan. He says, um, is it mandatory to follow just one imam? Or can we follow the Quran and Sunnah alone? And he said, in the Indian subcontinent, most of the people follow Imam Abu Hanifa. Mm. But he said, we find differences when compared to the other madhahibs that, um, that the, other maha, maza, the other mazhabs are more authentic in their opinion. He said, if you can advise us on the whole situation. Uh, first of all, yes, all of us, all Muslims throughout history and until the Day of Judgment are required to follow only one Imam. This Imam is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Besides this Imam, any Imam is an ordinary human being. Any Imam is an ordinary human being. What do I mean with that? I mean, every human being who is not a Prophet is subject to error, yes. is subject to be right or wrong. Not necessarily that he deliberately meant to uh, error or give a false uh, opinion. No, but because we're human beings. And that's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said about the true Imams who exert an effort in order to conclude a ruling for a question or a mas'ala or a condition or a situation which newly arised, did not exist in the past. They tried to find reference in the Quran and the Sunnah, they couldn't find. They tried to find uh, an example in order to measure it by analogy, they could not, for instance, such mm. as organ transplant, blood transfusion, things like that. It did not exist 1400 years ago. Okay? Yes. Uh, they, they, they do not have a reference, but they have related references. Can they make ishtihad? Yes, they make ishtihad based on the available references and their knowledge of the Quran, of the Sunnah, of the Arabic language, of the other opinions of the Fuqaha. What if one of them made an ishtihad and, uh, you know, according to the available evidence, then he reached a view. Later on, this view is proven to be totally wrong. The Prophet ﷺ said such person 
shall receive a full reward. But he erred. He made a mistake. Mm -hmm. His conclusion was false. And the scholars said, no, you should not take his opinion. But he will receive a package of a full reward for making ishtihad. This ishtihad was not done by you or I or mm. any of the current people. No, mm. by true scholars such as any of the four founders of the schools of thoughts, Imam Abu Hanifa, who is the greatest of all, Al-Shafi'i, Malik, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Sufyan al-Thawri, Yahya ibn Ma'in, and others and others and others. So those people were able to make ishtihad. But remember what I said, they may... Uh, after making ishtihad, their opinion would be wrong. Mm -hmm. If it is right, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Falahu ajran." He receives double reward: a reward for reaching the truth, and a reward for making ishtihad, for making the effort. So everybody shares this basic reward of making the ishtihad, whether he reaches the truth or not. But if he reaches the truth, then there is an extra reward for hitting the target. As I said. It is not ordinary people or seekers of knowledge or, you know, semi-scholars would make ishtihad. It's a very, very sophisticated process in order to be a mushtahd. Once we found out that according to the majority of the scholars, this scholar, ishtihad was overwritten. It is not valid. We don't have any right to say, but I am following this scholar regardless because he's my sheikh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. you and I are only following, and your Imam, like Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, he was following whom? All of his views, which he taught his students, about 12 of them became judges and other scholars, Muhammad, Abu Yusuf, Al Hassan, and others and others. Those scholars whom Imam Abu Hanifa taught, he taught them what? Did he teach them his own views, or he did teach them, he taught them the Quran and the Sunnah? The views were stemming from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So if it is proven that his view was uh, not the best, or there is a better view in the light of newer evidence or more sound evidence, then this whole view will be set up aside. Yes, we'll learn from it how he reached it, the principles of jurisprudence, but we will not be allowed to follow it. Mm -hmm. Because there is another view. Let me give you one example. Okay. In Hanafi Madhab, it is not permissible to raise the hands في تكبيرات الانتقال while you're going for Ruku' or rising up from Ruku' and going for uh, third Raka'ah mm -hmm. in, in, in a prayer which consists more than two Raka'ahs after Tashahud. Imam Hanifa does not believe that it is required to raise the hands and he says rather it is not permissible. Later on, we have tremendous Evidences and a great number of companions who have narrated that they have seen the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam raising the hands in four positions: Allahu Akbar in the beginning takbir, Allahu Akbar in going for ruku'ah, Sami Allahu liman hamida also raise the hands and in going to the third rak'ah. So we have a great number of companions. The Sahaba narrated that. Then accordingly, the vast majority of the scholars, Malik or Shafi'i or Abu Hanifa and others and others are of the view that it is Sunnah. It is recommended to do that. Somebody would say, no, I would still follow Imam Abu Hanifa. I say, based on what? Because I'm Hanafi. I say, that's not up to you. It is not permissible. Imam Malik, Imam Malik, people have labeled him as Imam Ahl al-Madina, al-Madina al-Munawara where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been buried there in his masjid. Uh, the Sahaba were there, at Tabi'een. So the, the true knowledge was in Al-Madina and is still in Al-Madina. Imam Malik was the imam of all the scholars in Medina. They said, لا يفتى ومالك في المدينة. No one is allowed to give a fatwa or opinion as long as Malik is alive. Malik himself stood next to the Prophet's grave. And he said, كُلُّ insan, every human being. By the end of the day, you and I are humans. The questioners, the viewers are humans, and I'm a human. They're asking me because maybe I know a little bit more, right? But all of us are humans. So our opinions, our views are subject to be right or wrong. That's why Imam Malik said, كُلُّ insan يُؤْخَذُ مِنْهُ وَيُرَدُّ عَلَيْهِ Every human being's opinion may be accepted, may be rejected. 
except for one person. Then he pointed to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and said, the one whose body has been laid down there. So other than Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is not infallible. Other than him is not the ultimate truth. So if any imam, whether local, live or dead, we should not stick to their opinions and be prejudiced. We are prohibited from being prejudiced, except to the Qur'an and the sound sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So when it is proven that now, uh, the, the scholars, vast majority of them said it is recommended to raise the hands. We find some people tend to fabricate a hadith in order to support the view of their imams. Oh. Such as a hadith which I heard that if you raise your hands in the other than the in the salah, then the prayer is invalid. Oh. He fabricated a hadith out of prejudice. Uh, because of religious zeal. They want to adopt this view and they want the people to follow their view and if anybody does not follow it, then his prayer is invalid. That is not true. So the true knowledge, and, and that's why one day I requested from Dr. Hatim al-Hajj, who is a very dear friend of mine and a colleague, uh, if he can introduce to us a program about evolution of fiqh. People are in, 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 in eminent need to know how the fiqh evolved, hmm. and who is Abu Hanifa, and who is Malik, and who is Al-Shafi'i, and is fiqh only limited to those four scholars? Some people think that there are no other scholars, no mujtahideen, but those scholars, whether during their time or any other time, so they would not take any opinion from others. And uh, some prejudice, uh, Muslims, if they are Maliki or Shafi'i or Hanbali or Hanafi, they think the madhab is the deen. Other than that, um, I attended once in, in, in one place where somebody uh, was talking about Hanafi madhab as my religion. Mm. And other madhab are different religions. That's totally false. And you are at risk if you believe that. The founders of the schools of thoughts are the leaders of the Muslim ummah in fiqh. Their opinions may be wrong may be right, depending on the references which they relied on and they base their views upon. If they're sound, fine. Otherwise, if they're weak, or because they did not know that the hadith is weak for innocence, then it will be neglected and will adopt the sound and the strong view. Wallahu a'ala. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for that comprehensive answer. We'll take a pause here on Ask Within. We'll be back right after this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. life of the Muslim starts at death. If you wish to enhance your knowledge of the Islamic perspective on the hereafter, this life doesn't go on forever, but we do so little to prepare for it because most of us don't know what happens after this life ends. If you want to be amongst those who know, then join us every Saturday at 1930 GMT for the inevitable journey. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're back on Ask Huda. And just a quick reminder that we're not taking any telephone calls on this program. We're just answering the emails we've been receiving from, from you, the viewers. And just a reminder of their email address. It's ask, that's ask at huda dot tv. Um, Dr. Muhammad, we have one here from Uthman Abdullah from Nigeria. And he says, what is the status of working in a bank that deals with interest? In Egypt, in a bank the deeds with interest is totally prohibited. What is the reference to that? A verse and several hadith. We'll take one hadith. The verse is of Surah Al-Ma'idah mm -hmm. in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدُوَانِ 
which means and help one another to do what's righteous and what's good and do not help nor assist one another to achieve what's prohibited and transgression. So helping by any mean in doing any sin, in committing any sin or transgressing the limits and the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibited. One hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the same hadith, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الْرِبَى May Allah curse riba, the interest-based transaction. Then he said, آكِلَهُ وَمُوكِلَهُ وَكَاتِبَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهُ He cursed five individuals mm-hmm. in a single business transaction which consists or includes riba. Subhanallah. آكِلَهُ the one who charges the interest. Mu'kilahu, the one who pays. The buyer or the borrower. Katibahu mm-hmm. is the scriber, the person who concludes it in writing. Mm-hmm. The auditor, the banker. Washahidayhi and the two witnesses. In case that we have witnesses. So anyone who's involved directly or indirectly in such business transaction which includes haram is included in the curse of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam somebody would argue and say well if I don't take the job somebody else will if you do not if you save yourself from the fire of hell somebody else is going to throw himself you're not required to throw yourself in fire in order to reserve a seat in it (laughs) You require to save yourself against fire, yes. from fire. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu quhu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. La yakun ahadukum imma'a. You guys should not be... Imma'a means a follower who is following blindly. Mm-hmm. So if I take you to a nightclub, you go with me. If uh, I take you to a mosque, you say everybody's gone, let me go. Mm-hmm. It is like... I always like to give this example. If you're driving in North America, in, in America for instance, and tailgating or whatever, if you're following an ambulance or somebody who's speeding, over speeding, if the speed limit is 70, maximum was 70, so somebody is driving 90, then four or five other vehicles would tailgate the person and drive with him. So they have almost, they maintain the same speed. Mm-hmm. So a police officer would capture one of them, would turn the siren on and would stop one. And would say, your license, why are you speeding? I know, but there was other five speeding. <laughs> he says, yes, I know, but I could only capture one at once. <laughs> so you cannot cast the blame on somebody else. كل نفس بما كسبت رهينة. Every soul shall be held accountable. For what he or she have earned. Yes. He cannot cast the blame oh. on others. Yes, there are sins where more than one person will be held accountable for. Like if you facilitate the sin to others, the, the doer and you will be held accountable for. <coughs> Similar to, <coughs> If you help others to achieve righteousness and goodness, they receive their own reward and you receive a similar reward without diminishing the reward of either one of you. Similarly, the case with committing sins. So you're not allowed to take such job because <coughs> there is a difference brothers and sisters between sometimes somebody is in a situation where he or she has to borrow in order to maintain their house or uh, pay the rent or 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 it's a situation where they have to commit this once yes. or twice and a person who is living mainly and earning from haram he's living and surviving on haram <laughs> Imagine that all what you do is earn unlawfully. All the food that you purchase from unlawful earning, the clothes that you wear in summer and winter, and you buy your kids school supplies and food and shoes and from haram. And maybe you save somebody in order to uh, money to, to, to move to a, a bigger house or buy a newer car, a newer model, or even go for hajj and umrah. You know, if you go for hajj and umrah from money that you have earned, uh, as a result of working in such bank, Hajj and Umrah is not accepted. It's valid because, yes, you have performed Hajj and Umrah. Mm-hmm. But Allah has informed us that He will not accept such ibadah, nor charity, 
Because Allah is good and He accepts that which is good. Only which is good. So from the beginning, give it up and look for something that is lawful. Another misconception. Another invalid excuse. Somebody would say, but you know the recession and the current situation and people cannot find a job. Mm -hmm. Even if people cannot find a job, do not take a haram job. It is dealing with what you're going to eat what you're going to wear, what you're going to be consuming on daily and on regular basis, and feeding your family members. And if you are a believer, you got to understand that Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ الرَّزَّاق is a form that shows that He is not just a provider, He is constantly providing. Uh -huh. So if you're seeking the provision from... Uh, any person then you're not a strong believer but if you're seeking the provision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you gotta know that if there is a provision that was ordained for you it would reach you you exert the effort you look for a job you apply here and there I can find uh, such position in a bank where I would dress up nicely drive a nice car wear a tie and suit and all of that even if you end up selling items on the street from halal, that mm -hmm. is better. That is better. Because end up feeding yourself from halal, I would not say the best choice is the only choice. Okay? Okay. Jazakallah uh, khair, We have a question here from a brother from Pakistan. He says, um, what is the best way to do istikhara? And uh, he said in Pakistan and in India, we are taught to offer two rakah of salah. And when you sleep, you'll have some indication like a white or a green color. And he said, here in the Middle East, I learned from my Arab friends that um, the person who accepts, uh, who prays to Raqqa Salah and go ahead and do his work, if it's in your favor, it will go well, and if not, it wouldn't go well. By the grace of Allah, I count on Huda TV, uh, by the grace of Allah, and by His will and leave, and other Islamic channels, in declaring the truth about the deen, not necessarily only, or not only to non-Muslims, but to Muslims, vast majority of Muslims confuse what's cultural and what's religious. And they believe in what's cultural more than what's religious. Mm -hmm. And they, they label cultural practices as religious. In every single episode, we'll have a question. I know that for sure. Um, uh, I love my brothers and sisters from Indo-Pak uh, background and society. But as the Arab have their own false practices, the Intupak also have their own false practices which have been inherited from various cultures and backgrounds. Salatul Istikhara have been explained in a simple hadith by Jabir ibn Abdullah who said in this hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to teach us Istikhara prayer as he used to teach us a chapter of the Qur'an. It was very regular, it was very repetitive. I mean, we have memorized how to pray Istikhara. So every single time the Prophet ﷺ oh, taught so. them was recorded and he concluded that in a hadith. He said, if one of you is about to do anything, let him pray two rak'ahs other than the fard, nafl. Either by praying independent two rak'ahs with the intention of praying istikhara, or it could be while praying any nafl, even if it is the greeting of a masjid, or an emphatic sunnah before or after the prayer, along with accompanying the intention of istikhara, so that by the end of the prayer, before taslim or after taslim, according to different views, you will make the dua of istikhara. Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi'ilmika wa astakbiruka bi qudratika wa as'aluka min fadlika al-azim. The hadith. And after you finish asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then, now we have different interpretation. People will say, you have to go to sleep, or the prayer has to be done before sleep time so that you can see in a dream an inspiration whether to do or not to do and what's the best choice. Many people say that I prayed so many times and haven't seen anything in a dream. Where does it say that you have to say to see a dream? Mm -hmm. Where? Nowhere. Where does it say that you have to receive some sort of inspiration? No. What has been revealed and we have been told about is that praying this as long as you fulfill the condition of being unbiased, do not have the tendency towards one decision over the other, then whatever decision Allah facilitates for you, that's Allah's choice. Whether you see a dream or not. You may see a dream, but it is not necessary. You may see some indications, but also it is not necessary. 
You may feel comfortable towards one decision over the other, but also it is not necessary. Whatever you do, whatever choice will be done, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would like for you to choose. Okay, okay. Uh, we have, uh, and then we have another question from a sister here. She says, uh, she's asking about Asqar as sabah that's mm. uh, the invocations in the morning. She says, sometimes when I sit to do it, I'm, I, I sometimes uh, lost uh, in, in, in the words I'm saying in terms of the meaning of the words that I'm saying. Mm. What, do I have to repeat these Asqar? No, you don't have to repeat them, but let me share with you something that a dhikr mm. could be done by different ways. There is dhikr, celebrating the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the heart alone by the tongue alone, by both heart and mind, and, and tongue. Mm -hmm. The best, of course, is a dhikr, or celebrating the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by uttering the words of praise while thinking about them, mm -hmm. pondering their meaning, yes. living with them. That is the best. The, the prophetic advice, لا يزال لسانك رطوا بذكر الله and living what you say, understanding what it means to say, سبحان الله العظيم وبحمده. Glory be to Allah and praise be to Him, the great, the greatest, and so on. So, that is the best category. Then, by the heart, then by the tongue. So, all of that is accepted, but the best is to utter it while pondering its meaning. Okay, and her second question, she says, sometimes I uh, sit on, until sunrise in, in making the zikr. But she says sometimes I have to get up to prepare lunch for my family who are going out, for the kids who are going to school. She wants to know if she, is, if she will get the same reward as Hajj. I hope and I expect, inshallah, Allah will give you the same reward as if you are still sitting in your place after the prayer, making the adhkar until sunrise and praying the two rakahs. Because we have a hadith in which the Prophet says, uh, Whenever the servant of Allah gets sick, or troubles. Kutiba lahu. Kutiba lahu in the passive. It, ha it will be recorded for him. And written for him. Mm -hmm. Whatever he used to do. Whenever he was healthy and resident. If somebody uh, has a habit of praying at night. Then he set up his alarm. And he did not wake up. He was so tired. Or now he's sick. Or he's traveling. The word of praying at night will be maintained fully for him for that night or those nights because he had the habit of doing so. A woman who sits after Fajr in order to uh, make azkar until sunrise and pray the two rak'ahs hoping to expect or expecting the word of the Hajj and Umrah will get it insha'Allah. But one time she has to prepare for the, the food for the school, for the kids, etc. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most generous. The, the, the beautiful hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas who narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا هَمَّ الْعَبِدُ بِحَسَنَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا كُتِبَتْ لَهُ حَسَنَةٌ كَامِلًا If the servant of Allah intended and was about to do a good deed but he was not able to fulfill it to do it Allah the most generous will record it for him as a complete good deed as if he has done it just for intending so I hope and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the same reward. Okay, we have another question from a sister. She says her name is Huda and she lives in a place called Somaliland. It's the first time I've heard of that name. But she says, um, Shaykh, can we blow on hot food? No, we can't. Whether it's hot or maybe there is some uh, um, ashes or impurities or, or because the Prophet sallallahu prohibited us. And it is very interesting, and it shows that the Prophet ﷺ and the religion of Islam uh, were pioneers in the personal hygiene. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the prophylactic medicine as well. You know that blowing, breath, breathing and blowing, uh, you're, uh, you're producing carbon dioxide. Yes. So when you blow in the food, whether because it's hot or otherwise, you are putting carbon dioxide in the food. Mm. So it is harmful for you and for those who may be joining you in eating from the same food. It is not allowed 
according to the prohibition of the Prophet ﷺ, he prohibited us from blowing in the food or the drink, whether they're hot. When somebody said that, uh, maybe it has some uh, uh, thorn or impurities, or whatever he said, remove it. So somebody said, I cannot drink all at once. I have to breathe in between. He said, then drink, then drop the, the, the cup or the glass, then take a breath and drink again and again. But do not inhale and exhale in, uh, in the cup or in the glass or in the plate. Okay, and our second question, she says, can we make, do uh, wudu and take a shower at the same time? Yes, with condition. That if you are performing ghusl in order to lift the major impurity, then the, this ghusl will suffice you for both ghusl and wudu. Because we have minor impurity and we have major impurity. So if you fulfill the purification uh, which will remove the major impurity, then accordingly it is more worthy, it will remove the minor impurity. Mm-hmm. Somebody had a sexual relationship with his or her spouse, then they performed ghost. Okay, they can pray afterward because they already have wudu, this ghost. But somebody is performed taking a shower or performing ghost on Friday as a sunnah, it's mm-hmm. not a mandatory. It will not be sufficient to perform ghusl and pray with it. You have to intend making wudu in this condition. Okay. There is a big difference. But if somebody is taking just a regular shower, then he is also required to perform wudu at last in order to be able to pray. Okay. Jazakallah Khai Sheikh for all the answers today and to all the viewers. Just before we leave, we would like to say that you can still send us questions at ask at huda. Dot TV. And for those who would like to support programs like these and more on Huda TV, you can write to us at support at Huda dot TV. Until next time, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. If my love is attached to thee, then from sins I will be free. Each time my heart will beat, your name will resound with thee. Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test.